It is really great to be here. Um, I want to thank Dr. Elon Dancy and the Center for Urban Education at Pitt for the invitation to be a part of the Summer Educator Forum. Uh, my name is Sonia Douglas and I'm a professor of education leadership at Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, I also serve as the proud director of the Black Education Research Collective, which focuses on conducting culturally sensitive research, um, facilitating research practice partnerships and advancing critical policy analysis. And so today I wanna spend um, about 40 to 45 minutes um, just delivering a presentation and overview of some of the research and the frameworks that have been helpful in the work that we do at Burke, um, as well as in education leadership and policy broadly um, that we think are promising in terms of how we think about improvements to education going forward and to ensure that the voices of students, of educators, and of community members are included in that process. Um, I also want to just quickly introduce um, two of our team members, Alexandria Lowe and Jay Jacobs, who have joined and will be available to help facilitate some discussion um, if we have time to do that today. So I'm going to start. Um, oh, is it possible that I can share my screen? I'm here, I'm just, oh, okay. Um, I just had some slides that I wanted to share, if possible. Will I not get to see anyone? <laughs> Hi, Patty. <laughs> Okay, as we wait, um, I'll just go ahead and get started and we can upload those um, shortly. Today, I wanna just talk about the challenge around equity discourses in education, uh, which in many ways remain overwhelmingly race neutral and colorblind. Um, even the discourses that take up issues of race and racism and anti-racism do so in a way that limits um, race as a variable, a demographic variable or a proxy for culture. And so part of the work that we're doing is really wanting to make distinctions between race and culture and what that means in research and practice. Uh, and finally, the fact that research on race is um, still very much segregated by method, methodology, the perspective of the researcher and practitioner, um, and just kind of where they're located um, within the larger conversations and experiences related to race. Okay. Hmm, it's still not letting me share. Is it possible to share it with Alexandria Lowe? Yeah. yeah, it's not just, it's not sharing my slides. Okay, so, so you did see it and it was just the slides. Okay, it's showing me a whole bunch of other things here. So how does that look? Okay, wonderful. This is the title of my presentation. <laughs> From Equity to Emancipation, Critical Education Policy and Leadership in Post-Civil Rights America. And the reference to Post-Civil Rights America is just an acknowledgement that a lot of the work that we're still engaging in now is very much, um, a product and extension of the civil rights movement and civil rights advocacy, affirmative action, desegregation, um, and making those linkages between those movements um, with the language that we're using more recently around equity, diversity, inclusion, um, and anti-racism. Um, so I've, I've discussed the problem um, given that overview. And so today I really wanna focus on the limitations of education research, which you know, really, even though we may not be as directly connected to it or not, 
um, has a lot of influence over what happens in schools, in school districts and communities around policy and practice. And so one, I want us to think about how the limitations of education research that itself may be racist, bias, um, and culturally illiterate uh, limits uh, and that lacks a political theory of race that also deals with the politics of race that are very much a, a part of our very current context um, have huge implications for leadership preparation and practice. And to then think about how we advance an education agenda that reclaims the power of leadership um, that's grounded in an understanding of history and politics of race and inequality in education. And despite all of the challenges and resistance to critical race theory, in many ways, this is what CRT um, um, has, I think, effectively done in, again, underscoring the importance of history and the significance of the politics of race and how it is meted out in terms of education and educational justice. The framework that I'm using to really shape this discussion around um, moving from equity to emancipation is grounded in um, three key concepts. The first is the politics of education policy, which is drawn from a book that I um, co-authored with Janelle Scott and Gary Anderson that again, really takes a critical policy approach to looking at what's happening in education. And so while we have typically looked at kind of these traditional um, and value neutral ways of thinking about education and the purpose as the great equalizer, um, as um, you know, the way, um, the pathway to the American dream, it's important that we really focus on what we see in front of us. And that is that education remains very much unequal, very um, um, racially biased and hierarchical. Um, and that those are many of the things that the equity discourses are really trying to address. The second concept is a concept developed by um, Lonnie Guinier, um, the late Lonnie Guinier, um, who was a legal a scholar and critical race theorist who really emphasize the importance of political race theory as a way to think about how racially marginalized groups can work together in building racial coalitions to advance their agenda uh, and on the political landscape. And so that also is another important piece to, to focus on. While we might have great research that informs what happens in classrooms, while we're focused on literacy and instruction and assessment, we need to think about how we're bringing to bear the resources the leader rep leadership representation and policy representation that allows us to have the conditions and the resources that are necessary to do the type of work that we want to do. And that's why community based work is so important to this. It's so much um, more than what happens simply in the school side or within the district, but how families, communities and other stakeholders are part of that uh, political process which includes voting, which includes uh, testifying before school boards, which includes being a part of the political process. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to point to um, this notion of using critical race theory as critical policy analysis, which is what I featured in, a, in an article that I authored uh, or published that was published in 2019 entitled School Integration and the New Jim Crow Opportunity or Oxymoron. And again, in this piece, I'm really teasing out the different ways that uh, situating history, politics and race help us to better understand not only the inequalities that we have continued to address over the years in education, but the current moment that we're in and how we can hopefully how this can serve as a tool to get us um, out of it. Um, really quickly, critical policy analysis is a framework that was developed by myself and my colleagues in really bringing together the literature um, that has used critical approaches to looking at policy and thinking about how it could apply in ways that support both leaders and policy makers, as well as practitioners. And so the first um, tenet is that, is that CPA, unlike traditional policy approaches, challenges traditional notions of power, politics, and governance. And so oftentimes in policy classes, we teach about the policy cycle, which starts with the identification of a policy problem, um, and then um, attempting to find out more about that problem, developing solutions, implementation of those solutions, and evaluation, as though it is a, a linear or circular process, when in fact, we know that the political process is much more complicated, messy, and irrational. And so critical policy analysis acknowledges that. I think what we're currently seeing in the federal and Congress <laughs> and in our state houses and local governments um, reflect how, again, the, the policy making process is very irrational and nonlinear. And in many ways, it's emotional. And so CPA brings um, all of those pieces to bear in thinking about how policy is actually enacted and done in ways um, that are effective and aligned with the goals of that particular policy. Second is examining policy as discourse and political spectacle. And this is also connected to the use of emotions, the power of persuasion, uh, most recently how social media platforms um, and the discourses that take place in those spaces really shape um, 
public policy. And so, you know, former President Trump was really a master at using politics and political spectacle in achieving his political goals and policy goals. And so again, CPA is not ignoring that fact, but being um, realistic and recognizing the different tools that are used, whether politics of fear, um, the politics of scarcity, um, and, and the politics of violence in many ways to advance um, policy goals, which is, you know, a, da a dangerous and scary place, but it's a part of the reality that we must face in thinking about um, what's happening in our schools and school systems. The third tenet of CPA is centering the perspectives of the marginalized and oppressed. And this is a theme that comes out, um, that shows up in critical approaches to inquiry and research um, in critical literacy, you know, anything that really centers questions of power. And so we need to think about who has power, <clears throat> How is that power being used and to what end? And by centering the perspectives of those who don't necessarily have power in the traditional sense, we can get a better understanding of the problems and the ways that we can address and support those who don't have power to build power, to build community capacity that will then lead to community transformation and social change. Uh, the fourth tenet is interrogating the distribution of power and resources. And so this again goes to the question of who gets what and why. Um, and so this is oftentimes the focus of education policy in the comparisons between dominant um, communities um, and oppressed communities in terms of who has access to what type of curriculum, what type of, um, of high quality teachers, of uh, culturally responsive and relevant leaders. Um, and so again, looking at how resources are distributed is really important. And I want to underscore that I think that while the equity discourse is focused on identity are very important, we cannot lose sight of equity within the context of resources. And that means funding, that means financial resources, that means um, property <laughs> um, assets that are then used to help um, develop capacity in communities for the long term. And then finally, number five is really important. And I think um, one of the ways that I hope that school community and university partnerships can be strategic in holding those in power accountable for policy outcomes. And so much of what we're seeing now too has been a multi-decade effort to dismantle public education, to starve it of resources, particularly in underserved communities, to teacher-proof curriculum, to uh, ensure that individuals are not necessarily critical independent thinkers, but delivering teacher-proof curriculum, packaged resources that help students maybe prepare for a test, but not necessarily for life in a democratic society. And so how do we hold those in power accountable for those policy decisions, whether it was the ending of teacher tenure, the end, ending of teacher licensure, the expansion of vouchers and school choice, um, where there were many promises that black and brown children in particular and black and brown communities specifically would benefit from the increased number of charter schools and choice um, to explain the outcomes that we currently see, to explain the conditions that we're currently confronting and um, to be held accountable for those policies as we think about the types of policies that will actually um, lead to equitable and just outcomes in education. And so that's why critical policy analysis is a really, again, important tool for, in my view, being realistic about what is happening on the ground in schools and in communities and being honest about those challenges and then figuring out who you need to have at the table to develop those solutions and implement them. Okay. And so one of the big questions, you know, that is raised for me now, especially as someone, you know, who, who um, helps work or who works in a leadership preparation program and in a graduate school of education is what role do educational leaders play in today's political and policy environment? And when I say leaders, I think that, that um, I use that term really in an expansive way to include student leaders, teacher leaders, and everyone who views themselves as, um, taking up some level of responsibility to influence or change what's happening in their environment. And so what role, sh role should educational leaders play now? Um, it's really sad and telling that you have superintendents and leaders across the country whose lives are being threatened um, over the um, belief that CRT or issues of race are being taught um, and that, that history should not be taught, that the history of racism um, and racial violence in America and discrimination, how that connects to what we see right now continues to play out. So, so what role do educational leaders play in determining what that curriculum looks like, what is taught, who is qualified to deliver, um, what we hope to see as a revised uh, and modernized curriculum, 
and how educational leaders manage the conflicting and competing points of view that members of their school community have, right? We know that in many places you may have half of the parents who believe that um, issues of race should be taught and, and half where they don't. And so how are leaders to negotiate this um, and whose research and what type of education should advance and inform those practices? And so, you know, I'm arguing that um, while equity is important and it's not to diminish that, um, for me, we have to really focus on this question of emancipation. And so what does it mean to have equitable education within a system that still constrains and limits, um, and I'll focus on peoples of African descent in particular in this, con in this instance. Um, how do we move from thinking about these constant comparisons between who gets what and trying to determine who needs more as opposed to thinking about how we really free ourselves um, intellectually, um, epistemologically, um, and practically from systems that were not designed to serve all students. And so one, it requires us recasting the problems of racial inequality, segregation, and injustice in schools as political ones, which again, I think the current moment has made this a lot easier in showing that these are political issues um, that have mapped onto education. Uh, the second is to use new conceptual tools and approaches that theorize race within these contexts. So in many times, you know, in many instances, I feel like race is just flattened to, you know, one person's maybe even cultural identity, maybe their racial identity. Um, but recognizing that race is a byproduct of racism and, you know, the challenge of the fact that when we use the concept of race, it often simply reifies um, inequality in whatever, um, in whatever context that we're using it. So for example, although we want to disaggregate student achievement data by race, what it does is typically produce, without ad addressing the, the, the root cause of it, it concretizes evidence now that shows that students of color do not perform as well as white students, for example. And so we need more tools to really theorize race and help us to, to unpack um, why race was constructed in the first place and the ways that even the work that we do around race continues to, to perpetuate it. Um, and then the third is to really, again, value the experiential expert knowledge of um, obviously community members and those who are and parents and those who are in schools, but also the experiential and expert knowledge of scholars and intellectuals um, who have been raised and bring with them an identity um, that is in many ways very much um, in tune with not only the marginalized perspective, but also the dominant perspective, um, which is, you know, the double consciousness that W.B. Du Bois spoke about for people who, especially Black people who are living in America. Okay, and so, um, oh, I think I went backwards here. In moving a, a bit forward to talk about political race theory, you know, this is I think a really powerful framework because it makes that direct link between race and power, right? And it helps us to diagnose the ways in which race and race hierarchy shapes um, outcomes and that it was intended to do that. <laughs> and so we shouldn't be surprised by that. And I think, you know, the narrative that schools were not designed to support everyone, that they're really a sorting machine where they sort some for leadership and opportunity and others for uh, mass incarceration or um, even middle management. Uh, political race theory helps us to really demonstrate and show how schools serve as an engine um, that sorts individuals <clears throat> based on their perceived ability, which is a problem. Um, it also conceptual conceptualizes race as a lived experience, a social location, location, and again, how resources are distributed. And so while identity discourses and the, the focus on racial identity is important, again, I think that we cannot lose sight of the fact that race still determines how resources are distributed, which then shapes the experiences connected to race, right? And so it's really about building power um, and using the tools available in a democracy to ensure that those, those resources are distributed equitably and fairly. Um, it also, I think, is promising for cross-racial racial coalitions. So as we talk about um, communities of color and the distinct needs and experiences of communities, which I don't think should be lumped together, but that there are shared agendas and interests um, that allow and, and require cross-racial coalitions to leverage solidarity where it makes sense, to resist race, again, as a byproduct of racism and um, leading communities of color to, to maybe fight for limited resources. Um, and then recognizing that change is most likely to come from those who are raised. 
And so while, you know, it is important to engage allies and Lonnie Guineer writes a lot about the need to make sure that we also have individuals who identify as white being a part of these coalitions, um, what that looks like and how it should be determined really should be led by people of color. And so at the Black Education Research Collective, one of the things that we have um, really sought to do was to, was to develop a set of values because we think that a shared vision of education is incredibly important to develop a plan for moving forward. There was a lot of discussion, um, even as, you know, in the early months of when COVID hit, that we don't want to go back to normal because normal was never equal. Um, but we see ourselves, you know, inertia kind of taking us back to figuring out how we can get back to schools as normal. Um, but I think that we, it's time that we really use this moment to think about an emancipatory vision of education, one that truly believes that education is a civil and human right. Um, one where we recognize and acknowledge that education is a social, cultural, and political process. It is not neutral, it is not objective. And again, we see that as we see the different views um, passionate views that people hold as it relates to what education should be providing to their children. Um, that education is a calling and a valued profession. Um, you know, it's sad that this needs to be stated, but I think that thinking about how um, teachers are prepared, supported, compensated um, has to be addressed. And, you know, you talk to policymakers and they often say, well, that's just a non-starter. <laughs> um, well, it has to be the starter because until we really elevate education as a profession and are able to encourage young people, many of whom unfortunately now have had a horrible experience uh, in schools, we have to make, we, we have to show that we value education as a profession to encourage the types of individuals that we want uh, to be a part of it and to stay in it. Um, the fourth is that education is a collective good and responsibility. And so it is troubling to often see that educators become, um, they bear the brunt of um, schools maybe not doing as well as, as people expect or doing the things that people want. Um, but we have to recognize that we all play a role in that. Um, we all, as, as members of community, have a responsibility to support our schools, whether by supporting our teachers, by supporting students, or even supporting them financially, um, and through our advocacy. And again, lobbying for resources and research-based approaches that we know will help um, students who have not benefited historically. And then the fifth value is that education is the practice of freedom. And so while we are often drawn and pulled and limited by the external pressures around accountability, around testing, um, and it has in many ways, you know, even shaped the way that I would say younger educators have been socialized into the profession. I mean, if you think of anyone who's entered after No Child Left Behind, um, you know, educators who were practicing before not No Child Left Behind and those after, it's a very different um, again, perspective and, and, and reality in terms of what it means to be a, an effective teacher. Um, and so we believe it's, it's important to center liberation, to center freedom, um, you know, to uplift the work of Paula Freire in, in, in notions of education being the practice of freedom and bell hooks, right? And so these are not new ideas, <laughs> but um, making sure that that research and that advocacy is brought to bear in our conversations in thinking about the ultimate goals of education. I'm gonna pause there just to see if there are any questions before I go into sharing some of the work that Burke has been doing that you know I believe is provides a good example of the type of work that we're talking about. So I'm gonna pause here to see if there's any questions or reactions. Good morning, Sonia. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Did you have a question or comment? I'm sorry, I'm trying to see. Oh yeah, it's me, Elon. Elon okay, Dancy. I, I don't have my, hi, Dr. Dancy. <laughs> <laughs> I just have my slides in front. There you are. It's good yes, to I see just, you. I just wanted you to see a familiar face. And thank, thank you. you thank you. Here. This is great. You. You're aging backwards. <laughs> like I'm trying to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep going. Um. So, you know, we were really excited last year. Well, not excited, it was actually a really, you know, traumatic time um, last year as we were in the midst of COVID and received some Spencer funding to conduct a study, really just to get a sense of how people were doing. We wanted to know, um, we had two questions um, really for um, stakeholders and communities across the country. And that was, you know, what is the impact of COVID-19 on the education of black children 
and youth in the US and how should educators and community leaders respond to calls for change and action. And so we drew from Dr. Linda Tillman's work in terms of culturally sensitive uh, research approaches to again, just ask, leave it really open ended and ask folks how they were faring um, and what they thought needed to happen. And we encourage participation by saying, you know, we don't want to just spend time with you through interviews and focus groups and surveys. Um, during, a, again, a traumatic time, people were dealing with loss, the stresses of trying to work um, during that time and, um, you know, having children at home and, and um, kind of adjusting to virtual learning. Um, but saying that this is an opportunity for you to be a part of the solution. You know, we really want to hear from you so that we can figure out as researchers how to make this happen. Uh, and so we collected uh, data last year between January and May in the cities listed um, here on the screen and um, are really continuing to do this work. And we've, we've, we're actually doing a, a deeper dive right now in New York City since the pandemic continues to rage on um, has, and has tremendous um, implications in the city. Uh, especially. And so these were the findings. Um, and, you know, while individually they're not surprising, I think what was stunning was that they showed up pretty consistently across all of the metropolitan areas that we looked at, despite the geographic diversity of those communities. Um, and so again, this is, I won't spend too much time on this, but there certainly has been and continues to be a disproportionate traumatic impact on Black students, families, and communities. There were serious concerns, and most of the participants, as was noted earlier, were women, mothers, and educators. Okay, many of them wore multiple hats, um, which I also think speaks to those who, you know, really wanted to be a part of this process and had strong views about um, how, how we get, how we recover um, from the multiple pandemics. The second is that, and, and it's that racial trauma and mental health are going to have huge implications, right? Just even in terms of stress and brain architecture, like what that means for learning. We're seeing this in terms of behavior uh, in schools and even everywhere, right? On the road, <laughs> driving um, from place to place, you see that um, the impacts of the pandemic have certainly had an impact on mental health. And we don't really have the capacity in terms of mental health service providers, counselors, social workers, clinical psychologists in schools and communities to help address this. And so that's something else that we've really been paying attention to and thinking about how we can support and develop that pipeline around culture responsive um, clinicians um, and counselors. Um, participants you know, said that schools are just not equipped to meet the, black, the needs of black students, whether academic, social, emotional, um, and that that needs to be addressed, um, that trust has just further been diminished in terms of the lack of response to COVID as well as the insurrection at the Capitol and other events. Again, this was right, um, the data was collected right after the election. Um, so just to take us back to that moment, it wasn't that long ago, but we were going through major transitions there in terms of our political administration. And then finally, again, that um, leaders and policymakers must be held accountable. And so how do we not only acknowledge or you know, even protest or resist the things um, that are happening to students in schools, but really advocate for them and make sure that people are held accountable for um, the, the things that our students experience. And so out of those findings, we developed these six recommendations that in many ways serve as a blueprint for um, Burke's agenda and one that we invite all who are committed to equity and justice to take up. Uh, the first is to perfect and protect and defend the rights of black students to receive a safe and appropriate education. Um, you know, we've seen this over and over again on the news and in social media in terms of black students literally physically um, being violated, apprehended, um, in addition to the psychological and emotional um, trauma that they are exposed to in schools, in the places that should be safe houses. Uh, and so we have to find ways to have, <clears throat> to develop rapid response in my view, um, when things happen to students um, to make sure that they know that they're protected and that um, there is um, a strategy for advocacy um, when things arise and that we're not just sharing kind of these negative experiences, but having a way to address them and, and let um, those in power know that it is not okay and that we will not accept it. Um, the second is to invest in mental health supports and trauma-informed practices, which I mentioned. Um, Again, this is an area where schools and districts, I think, are beginning to really try to find ways to support students. But now, given the scale of it, um, we definitely need to invest resources in providing those supports. And so we're working on ways to do that. Um, the third is to provide professional development to practicing teachers and leaders. And so this is actually 
um, been a major focus of the work of the Black Education Research Collective over the last year. Um, it's related to item four, which is modernizing curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. Um, and so we heard loud and clear from Black parents and educators that we need a Black Studies and Black History curriculum in our schools, that there needs to be a corrective to the lack of information and the misinformation that is currently being provided. Um, and that that also requires the development of educators who know, um, who have the content knowledge as well as the strategies um, to deliver this content. And so as we have been embarking on this work in New York City over the last 10 months, um, it is underscoring kind of the, the deep the deep and long-standing work and multi-generational work that this is gonna require. Um, but we have to start now. Um, the fifth, fifth, which is related, is investing in the preparation, cultivation, and mentoring of culturally relevant educators. And so we have learned a lot about the uh, positive impacts of culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, in terms of not only anecdotal, but empirical evidence. And so that needs to be incorporated into our teacher and leader preparation. Um, and, and to my earlier point, making sure that teaching is valued as a profession so that we can encourage the young people now, ideally those who have access to black studies, those who will have experiences with culturally relevant educators who want to be a part of the education community. And then finally, um, and I don't think this is news to anyone here, but making sure that we're engaging Black students, families, educators, researchers, and community leaders, not only to be at the table, but to be the experts and equal partners in equity and justice work. And so there's so much information, a richness of perspective um, that our communities have. It was illustrated, I think, beautifully in the report. We have some word clouds that are included and other things um, based on the open-ended responses from the surveys, which were rich with, um, strategy, the suggestions and recommendations um, that we've distilled here, but um, that we again think underscore um, just the incredible cultural capital that exists in our communities and that it's really our job as researchers not to tell communities what to do, but to um, work with them to think about how we can support them in making that happen. And so that's the end of this part of the presentation. Um, just sharing some information here. I'm actually going to maybe ask Alex or Jade to put a link to the reports in the chat, which will be easier to access. Um, and then at this time, I'd like to just open it up to questions and, and see where we go from there. Sonia, I uh, placed a, a question in the chat. Um, so I'm really excited about what I've read about the uh, work that you're doing that feels like collective work to advance Black studies in the curriculum uh, in New York. And I was wondering if you might be able to talk a bit about how you uh, organized in order to do that uh, work. So I think as you have um, uh, clarified really well, you know, there's not a lot of people that we work with within institutional hierarchy that are chomping at the bit, as we say in the South, to do this work. So you have to organize strategically. Um, and I feel like that would be so useful to, you know, many of us on the call, maybe in Pittsburgh, who would like to do a similar kind of uh, work. Um, so that if you can kind of map for us, you know, how you um, have strategically organized to advance it, I think that would be um, so meaningful. I'd be happy to, and we'd love for Pittsburgh to be one of the cities that, you know, yeah. engaged in this process. Um, I have to give credit to um, the community organizations that we are working with as part of um, what's called the Education Equity Action Plan Coalition. Um, and so it's been years in the making in that there were several groups organizing in New York City over the years um, to advocate for a Black Studies curriculum. And so you had basically the political will that aligned with the moment in, um, and I'll name the organizations, the Eagle Academy Foundation, the United Way of New York City, the Association of Black Educators of New York and Black Ed Influencers United and Burke that are um, engaged in this work. Um, and so it's been, you know, it's, it's messy, it's difficult. <laughs> Um, you know, especially when resources are involved, right? And and when it has not been done before. And so what we have done, you know, we immediately, the other challenge with this though, you know, we, I think we certainly would have done it differently with more time. And so we received the funding at the end of September. Well, we received notice of the funding, not the actual funding, and then had to have an entire PK-12 interdisciplinary curriculum completed by June 30, um, which is what we're in the throes of uh, wrapping up right now. Um, and so what we immediately did was, oh, I, I brought together my advisory board. <laughs> so I think that's actually 
as I'm saying this, one of the reasons we we're able to do this is that we had kind of in an infrastructure of individuals who had enough content expertise that I could call on and say, this is an opportunity. And they said, okay, let's do it. Um, and to help identify them, the team that we needed in terms of content experts, curriculum writers, program evaluators, or evaluators and then hiring up a, a, an amazing team of researchers, research assistants and postdocs. Um, the other part of that was then really trying to identify the entry points on where, because ultimately we want this to be implemented, right? <laughs> There's so many reasons why it won't be or can't be or might not be. And so it was also engaging educators to better understand curriculum projects in the past, what worked, what didn't. Um, and then we inst ended up instituting design labs. So the Burke Design Labs was a model where we really wanted to look at curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment together by picking, you know, we identified like 12 schools that were really interested and excited about the curriculum and wanted to pilot it. Um, and then we kind of built out, um, I guess it was like a pilot um, over a couple, three months where the teachers, you know, had access to the lessons, they delivered them, they got feedback from students, and then they came together as a professional learning community to, to share that. And so that information was then useful to our team in terms of incorporating that to the curriculum. So there's a lot of there's lots of parts to it. And I guess if there's more specific questions, I'm happy to answer because there are there's a stakeholder engagement piece, there's the curriculum development piece, there's a professional development piece, um, and then there's the the political aspects of it. Thank you for that. Don't be surprised if I if I follow up. Sure. <clears throat> Can I ask a question, Dr. Douglas? Please, hello. How you doing? My name is Sister Aisha. I work um, in the Pittsburgh Public Schools. And I wanted to, um, my question is about when we look at reform culture um, and its impact on the mindsets of people that, depending on how long they've been in urban education, it could be anywhere from one year to 10 years of just reform, which is where the pressure gets put on to change and to do more in the capital capitalization of education and you just see a list of, of of things that are going on and I'm wondering how you see reform culture and its impact on on mindsets of educators because the lists of of, of demands inside of reform culture are very very exhaustive like they're huge just the things that people want the things that people are talking about but people also talk about being fatigued from reform. It's like, oh, here's this thing coming again. We're not sure if that's gonna be the moment. And when I think about the tone that was set yesterday with um, you know, utilizing new methodologies to really, really get this work done, sometimes it feels like reform is like a dark cloud over our heads when we're still trying to get free. you know. And I wondered if, if, that, if that question makes sense, if you could speak to that, please. Sure, thank you, Sister Aisha. Um... Indeed. Uh, yeah, I think that is the challenge. And when you say reform, I'm, I don't want to assume I know what you mean, but I'm thinking more the neoliberal reforms. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's what I'm saying we need to get free from, <laughs> you know, like it is and acknowledging that because I think that a large number of educators to your point, those who have been prepared under that regime, don't necessarily see it as a regime. Um, and what we're trying to do is say no, that's not really the structure of the types of reforms that are going to liberate in this case, black children and young people. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 I think, also learning from our elders and ancestors around how they navigated those systems. So, and Vanessa Siddle Walker writes a lot about this, right? And so there's some of it has to be the subversive work where we have our own agenda. We have our own vision of what we wanna do. And then we think about how we advance that sometimes within the institution or maybe beyond it. Um, but to me, I think that's really, a useful strategy in thinking about what can be accomplished instead of, instead of spending all of your energy trying to fight the institution that's just going to that has so many resources and time all the time in the world to fight you back as opposed to saying you know what and this is what Burke is really all about like we we want joy in our work we want to just kind of focus on what we know to be true what our communities and the people that we speak to say that they want and figure out how to make that happen um and so I don't know if that's the best answer, but I, I think it is a long game. And just, again, being strategic on building, you know, I've been telling everyone we need to build a new house. <laughs> I wrote a book called Learning in a Burning House. It's like, well, we need to build a new house. And so instead of always trying to like put out the fire and respond to, you know, what's happening over here, how do we really value the assets that we have? 
and the social and cultural and community capital that we possess. And now for many of us, the research tools and the tools and resources of the institutions that we work at to help communities like supporting the implementation and making it happen. So I think, you know, that's again, the approach that we're using and, and one that I think, you know, we'll see what happens, but so far it's been helpful at least in being able to get the resources, right? And now recognizing, yes, we have a curriculum to write, but as part of that process, what are the other ways that we could build community capacity, right, as part of that process? Thank you. You're welcome. There's a uh, question in the uh, chat box too about any advice for Black educators on how to agitate and make positive change. Yes, I mean, I think I think we there's the power of the collective, right? And so you know, we're also thinking ways of how we just make sure we are not working independently, um, suffering sometimes in silence in, in our own school or district or higher, you know, or college of education, um, but rather joining forces and recognizing that we are, our, our, we are a part of a very large movement, that there are lots, there's as many people who is, are resistant to um, ensuring educational just, justice and opportunity for all children, there are so many that are committed to it. And so again, part of what we're trying to do is make those connections among black educators um, so that you're not doing this work alone. Because I think that can be dangerous um, when you're the lone voice trying to speak truth to power. But if you have the backing of research of a network um, and other individual organizations, you know, I think we need to do more um, institution building uh, to provide that support and cover for educators. Um, so it's not an immediate answer, but I think that's part of what we're trying to build. Again, the work, I know the work that Dr. Nancy is doing as well. It's just kind of, again, building our capacity so that we're not doing this work alone. And we invite all of you to reach out to us as well um, as we continue to plan. And because this, this type of feedback too helps us think about how we can plan programming and, and other opportunities to support educators. Um, if there's not another question, I have another question for you, uh, Sonia, which is just about um, getting reading recommendations uh, from you. So I, I don't want to um, de devalue at all the importance of study to the work that we're doing. That's very, as I read across the Black radical tradition, study has, um, has always been important for uh, political resistance and work toward uh, freedom. So I actually wanna ask you to advise us about what we can be reading. So we know we have your, your work um, and uh, I, I have it all and read it all. But um, as we think about, for instance, um, I don't know, political educational organizing, um, are there any texts that you might suggest that we read? In the center, for, uh, for instance, we organize um, formal and probably informal study opportunities and reading groups uh, to actually help us to be able to identify uh, strategies that we can use that are quite frankly insurgent strategies. And so, um, you know, sort of holding up, uplifting the value of reading and study to uh, our collective organizing and resistance work, what might you recommend that we um, be reading to help, help mm -hmm. us there? And even in the center that we could design, you know, study groups, are, you know, around. We'd love to study with you too, by the way. Okay, oh, great. Um, <laughs> I see Jay put a link to our, book. we have a Burke bookshelf on our website, just some books, some of our favorites and the things that I think really shape, you know, what it is that we do. I like Solomonsky's Rules for Radicals. I mean, again, it's a quick read, but I think it again helps with, to me, political strategy. Because I get concerned sometimes, you know, again, there's the way that we want the world to be and the way that it is. And there's a, dist <laughs> you know, a great distance between those things. And so I think the more we educate ourselves on the reality of the political process, mm -hmm. you know, which CPA is kind of lifting up and that, you know, it's relative, it's not neutral. Um, you're not gonna, it's, politics is not pure. You're not gonna win everything you want the way you want it. Um, and so I think some of that, you know, and I'm a critical pragmatist, which I know some people have issue with, but, you know, pragmatic, you have to be pragmatic in terms of the fact that we want to make sure that kids have access to the type of learning materials and teaching that they should get, that some people are still hungry right now and need 
better opportunities for employment to be able to take care of themselves. We have a housing crisis, right? So while we may want all of the things, I think it's important to set goals, again, that are really defined at the community level and not lose sight of the fact that, you know, um, sometimes we have to engage in the negotiation uh, around what it is that we want and what we might be willing to give up for now in order to um, achieve what we want going forward. And to me, it's really about building power. Um, Lonnie Guinier, I'm a big fan of her work too, Miners Canary, which has been out for a long time. But I think that the work on political race coalitions was just so you know ahead of our time. <laughs> We're still trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, so those are, I mean, I think two around organizing in particular. And I think just really, just paying attention to capital B politics, so like the big, the parties at the national level, the party structure at the state level, what's happening in your local communities. I always say it's good to volunteer for a campaign, um, you know, cause you just kind of, it, it's a whole world unto itself and it's very niche. And so when you kind of get in that space, you realize again, that these are not rational decisions, but ones that um, are influenced by power. Thank but, you. Uh, yes, indeed. You're welcome. Any other questions or things to share? Maybe some promising practices, things that you have found to be really effective uh, in the work that you do? I believe you're muted. Sorry, I found, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I found that even though um, equity is currently imagined on, on a racial binary, that one of the things that I do in my practice is I look at equity very globally and, and I try to include um, globally diverse populations in what I do. Um, it was comforting to hear African descendants named um, from this morning and even yesterday. And, I just couldn't find enough of a reason to not include um, BIPOC populations in what I do when I'm able to. And a lot of it is mind and heart work at the same time, but to know that, that in order to be culturally relevant and equity evident at the same time, that there's a solidarity piece, right? A solidarity piece between African-American people and, and other black and brown people and African um, migrant people in the school district that I work in. And since 2014, I've been able to build enrichment structures for that population in an effort to unify the two and to not have to pick and choose one side over the other because I feel both sides are equally important. So that's, that's the one thing that I do that's, that's working to make equity global, especially being a, a person that's a migrant myself, it made sense and it, and it positioned me to not ignore the, peop the, the young people that I see when I'm working in school communities. Thank you for sharing that. What, what age group do you work with? Um, elementary school, middle school, and high school students across a couple of schools in Pittsburgh. And could, what have you found to be the, the most like, effective ways of you know, kind of bridging again across cultural differences? So it's to name what culture preservation looks like, first of all, and to understand that by not generalizing people's identities and, and becoming comfortable naming religions, naming ethnicities, naming countries, naming migrant stories, so that we can really understand that there's two dynamics that are going on, that some of our migrant students come with the privilege of, of, of coming not due to issues of war or issues of things that force them out of their country. And then there's, you know, then there's some that have that narrative and to frame that within um, a cultural context has been helpful to build empathy and compassion in the community. So that's one of the, one of the first things that we do. Secondly, it allows um, 
you know how there's a critique about how Black History Month is just shouldn't be a one time a month thing or, you know, Kwanzaa shouldn't be something that you do one time out of the year. It's a, a year round thing. We take the immigration heritage legacy work and women's international history work and, and funnel it through the whole entire year so that by the time those times of the years come around, we've practiced it enough to feel like this is not something we have to do only in this moment, but it's something that we do year round. And then I think the, the last thing that I could name of a couple more is that it unifies African-American and continental African populations. And in my practice, I've seen there's a tension between the two sometimes, and we name what our similarities and differences are so that we can bring the two together and we're able to explore what solidarity looks like in an urban educational space. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I mean, we, you know, we have so much diversity in New York City, even among peoples of African descent and something that comes up quite a bit. And so um, just thinking about the ways that you've done that has been, you know, can be really helpful to the work that we're doing. So thank you for sharing that. Any others? Are you getting out of class early today? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there aren't, I mean, if there aren't any others, you know, I, I just want to say that, um, and it's just good to see you, Elam, because I know that a lot of time has passed, but I just am so impressed with the work that you've done <laughs> during your short time at Pitt and just, again, finding ways to, I think, build a movement, you know, the, the time is ripe. So um, however Bert can, and just myself and uh, Bert can support what you're doing, um, we want to bring educators together and, and create the type of educational system that we all want to be a part of, you know, and I think it's doable. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Sonia, thank you for that. I'm um, equally inspired by the work that you're by the work that you're doing. And I was uh, Googling, I've been keeping up with you, but then I saw what you were doing with the work collective and some of these uh, recent gains. And um, so I um, knew that I wanted uh, QCEP to provide a, a, a forum to provide an, you know, an, an audience and um, engagers of your uh, work. And so we'll be following up in the center for sure to see how we can work together. I would love that. Thank you. Are you gonna close this out or <laughs> are there any other questions? <laughs> You're welcome. Well, what's Thank going you. twice? <laughs> yeah, I guess there are none. Um, oh, thanks. I'll talk uh, slower next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Douglas, for uh, for being here. It's great to see you again. Uh, there's a lot more uh, QCEP left, uh, folks. Uh, thanks for being here this uh, this morning. And you know, we have two critical race theory conversations that are uh, coming up. Um, and you don't want to want to miss those. And um, these are exciting opportunities that we have to engage people who do work at the intersections of law and education. Uh, so we have Dorothy Roberts and we have Cheryl Harris in our first uh, session. Later on today, we have Ian Haney Lopez and uh, Emily Ho in the next session. And that's going to close us out for today. And then tomorrow, uh, a number of uh, conversations that inform our work in education. So uh, one that's focused on food and justice, another that's focused on the school prison nexus, and another on uh, homeschoolers. So um, if we don't know, there is certainly a homeschooling uh, movement that is taking <laughs> root building, um, has existed, and is building in Pittsburgh. And so um, these are going to be three great conversations uh, to learn from tomorrow. So uh, lots more QCEF left. Um, and thanks for being here. Sonia, great to see you. Thank you all. Take care. Stay safe.